Good morning, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, depending on where you are. Uh, on behalf of the Institute of International and European Affairs, I'd like to warmly welcome you to uh, today's address by Volker Turk, who is uh, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. Uh, this event is part of the Institute's Global Europe project, which is supported by Ireland's Department of Foreign Affairs. The High Commissioner will speak to us for about 15 to 20 minutes, and then we'll go to a Q&A uh, with our audience. First, some, some housekeeping points. Um, the presentation by the High Commissioner and the Q&A will be on the record. Um, you'll be able to join the discussion using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Uh, please feel free to uh, come in with any comments, questions, uh, which occur to you uh, during the event, and we'll, we'll try to get to them in the Q&A. Please feel free also to join the discussion on Twitter using the handle uh, at IIEA. We're also live streaming the discussion. Uh, so a very warm welcome to all of you who are joining us via YouTube. I'd now like to introduce the High Commissioner. Volker Turk took up his present role uh, in October of 2022. Um, an Austrian citizen, he holds a doctorate in international law from the University of Vienna and a master of law degree from the University of Linz and he has published widely on international refugee law and international human rights law. His long and distinguished career has been devoted essentially to advancing universal human rights in various settings. He has held a number of key posts within the UN system, including that of Under Secretary General for Policy in the Executive Office of the UN Secretary General. Before that, he was the Assistant High Commissioner for Refugees at the UNHCR in Geneva from 2015 to 2019. As it happens, I worked closely with Volker uh, when he was in that role and I have the warmest memories from a, a very fruitful collaboration. Um, uh, the High Commissioner has now, of course, taken up a new and, and very uh, sensitive and difficult international role for which he is eminently suited. And with that, uh, High Commissioner, I'd like to invite you to take the floor. Well, thank you very, very much, first of all, for the invitation, and it's it's great to to, to see uh, you, David, my my old friend from from a, from our past uh, on a very very important topic. It was the New York Declaration on on refugees and migrants that you so so skillfully co-facilitated, and I, I remember it it extremely well. And I I have to say I've always admired your incredible uh, experience when it comes to to multilateralism and uh, very thankful for that maybe also just before i begin i i have to say when you think of ireland in a way it's almost synonymous with human rights because of course one of the second as you know the second high commissioner was irish former irish president mary robinson so i think there is uh, somehow those of us uh, who grew up with human rights in a way uh, know very well how how much uh, Ireland, um, and in particular, the, my form, one of my predecessors, has contributed um, to to the human, to the global human rights cause, and and also with this very vibrant um, uh, civil society in Ireland, but also the the foreign policy of Ireland, so much dedicated to human rights, and I really want to pay tribute to that at, at the very beginning. So I would like to thank you for being able to join you in this webinar which we know is always there to enrich also public debate on some of the key priorities that Ireland faces and also beyond Ireland, of course. And this comes at a very critical time. We are commemorating the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So I'm really very happy to speak to you how we can rekindle the spirit of of, of that declaration and the world's commitments to advancing human rights. Of course, there's also the 30th anniversary of the Vienna World Conference on Human Rights. I was in Vienna last week to commemorate that as well because it actually gave birth to this institution that I now represent. Um, I also understand that this seminar, or this webinar is joined by participants from different parts of the world, Africa, Middle East, the United States and across Europe. So that's incredibly helpful and I know well your institute but also its reputation for 
independence and public policy expertise. And I very fondly recall the hospitality, and may I call it the famous Irish hospitality that you extended to me six years ago when I was with you in person. And it was indeed when I was assistant high commissioner in, in UNHCR. Um, so let's perhaps go a little bit into the anniversaries that I mentioned. Um, when I came into, the, into this office uh, about eight months ago, I thought because of the geopolitical context in which we are, that it's really important to re-energize and, and find a way to build again this consensus that we must have on, on, on human rights and what better to use of one can make of anniversaries is precisely this. And we then launched this Human Rights 75 initiative so that the Universal Declaration's promises of equality, of justice and human rights for all is, is really heard loud and clear and translated into practice. And we really need countries across all continents to recommit to these fundamental promises and to the universality of the human rights regime. Because we know the type of challenges the world is facing. And I, I just want to go through some of them and, and highlight how much this has got to do with the human rights uh, agenda. First, of course, threats to peace and security. In Europe, since the Russian invasion of Ukraine, 24th February 20, last year, we have seen every day the images of, of fighting and of, of the impact on civilians. And it's just, you know, if you think of how many people actually got displaced either internally or across borders, it's an unimaginable number of 14 million people. Um, Ireland has played, of course, a very important role in, in welcoming refugees from Ukraine. But this is only one situation of conflict and violence that concern us all, and, and especially in Europe, we hear a lot about Ukraine, but let's not forget, there are so many other crises around the world um, that are protracted, where you don't see much movement, where people suffer enormously. And, and the latest one is indeed Sudan, the devastating fighting that is occurring there that was in the limelight of media attention for a while, but in a way, ever since especially diplomats were evacuated, somehow it has fallen off, off the radar. Despite the fact that Sudanese people suffer enormously every day. And I was there in, I was, it was my first mission um, as high commissioner and I was there and I was actually quite hopeful when I went in November because I saw the resilience of the people and it's devastating to see what, what is happening to the country, which, really is reversing the advances that have been made, but also the hope that the country had and the people of the country had, and it's really being held hostage by, by the fighting that is taking place between these two men. The second is the catastrophic impact of the triple, what we call in the UN the triple planetary crisis, climate change, pollution, and biodiversity loss which, and you probably saw yesterday, the Secretary General was very outspoken about his deep worries about climate action and the lack of climate action. Um, and really no country is spared from the increasing suffering and chaos that these, this, this double, this triple crisis creates. And of course, the human rights impact of these threats are massive and, and they will grow worse. If you just imagine in and look into the future if, if the, if the 1.5 degree centigrade uh, threshold is not met and we have higher rise in temperature that goes if the predictions are correct and if things don't change we would even see an increase in up to three degrees centigrade uh, by the end of this century I mean you can just imagine what this means and how the world would look like and it would be absolute chaos and this directly impacts people and as a result, our, the fulfillment of our human rights. Um, and it's, it's good that the General Assembly last year in July agreed that everyone, regardless of where they live, has a right to a clean, healthy and sustainable environment. 
and we will, my office will continue to advocate very much for the rapid and, and equitable phase out of fossil fuels and for remedies for people that are harmed by climate change. And there is a particular issue on climate financing that remains to be addressed. The third challenge is digital. Uh, artificial intelligence, you, you have seen, I'm sure, a lot of the reporting on, around generative AI, deep fakes, bioengineering, they are moving so quickly that government regulations are really hard pressed to keep up. And the implications for human rights, when it comes even to human agency, are enormous. We cannot, when we cannot be sure what is true, none of us can feel secure. It seems likely that trust will be profoundly eroded, trust in our institutions and also trust in each other. So we need governments to come together with careful regulations that enable the benefits of digital technology, but also overcome the digital divide that we see while placing guardrails on its potential harm through a human rights lens. Of course, the UN has an important role to play through its convening power, but also through promoting solutions and human rights will be part of the solution uh, in, in the way that things are regulated. And we have just recently seen in Europe, uh, the AI regulatory process has quite advanced. Uh, we now have to see how this goes further, but it could potentially be an important model for the world. Fourth area that I want to highlight is the pushback against threats to women's rights and the rights of LGBTIQ plus people. And in order to do to counter this pushback, we really need to work on addressing much better the widespread and increasing restrictions on, on civil society and civic space. In many countries around the world, people are not empowered to be present or vocal at the tables where their futures are divided. And this makes all other crises worse, climate, security, tech, discrimination, and inequalities. So the common language of human rights, and that's what we keep emphasizing, is really the compass that points the way out of today's turmoil. It points us to the exit from the pushbacks that deprive people of their rights and freedoms. And it is the path that advances peace, a healthy social contract, and shared prosperity. Universality means that all actors need to commit to using that compass. And I, I really feel strongly that we need to rejuvenate this worldwide consensus on human rights to overcome the many crises that humanity faces. We must anchor our actions in human rights if we are to have any hope of achieving the sustainable development goals by 2030, which is, let's not forget, less than seven years from now on. And as the climate crisis has shown us, we must pay particular attention to how our actions today can protect and advance the fundamental rights of young people and of future generations. The Human Rights 75 initiative that my office leads in cooperation with many partners focuses on universality, on progress and engagement. And we will have a high level event on 11th and 12th December in Geneva we look and we hopefully will get pledges from member states, but also other actors, including cities, businesses, civil society, UN entities, with visionary transformative ideas for human rights and future challenges and how, how that comes together. I hope we can count also on a pledge from Ireland and, and from many of you, if you represent institutions here today, uh, when you come uh, and join us in December. Um, and I, I know how much, especially when it comes to Ireland, how long, how much you have championed the human, universal human rights cause, um, especially also when Ireland was a member of the Human Rights Council um, and focusing in particular on right to freedom of religion, of belief, freedom of expression, civic space, gender equality, and the rights of LGBTIQ plus people. Um, Ireland also has a long tradition of supporting human rights defenders. Um, including through your uh, humanitarian visa program, but also the grants and assistance that you provide to organizations like Civicus, Frontline Defenders. And I've recently met 
the Special Rapporteur on Human Rights Defenders, Mary Lawler, who is Irish, as you know, and who is a very, very strong advocate for, for this cause. When I just come back to when, we, when I talked about the crisis that we face, and I did mention civic space, let me just come, uh, come back to, to that, because in the civic space, we also see the potential for long-term transformation. We know that the broadest possible participation in governance at all levels, from local to global, is more likely to ensure a fair distribution of resources and more effective and legitimate solutions to our challenges. And this directly relates also to economic, social, and cultural rights, apart from civil and political. And relates to the right to environment. We know that the inclusion of diverse voices, especially those who have been marginalized or who suffered discrimination, helps us to address grievances and prevent tensions and conflicts. And as the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has pointed out, and I quote, adaptation and mitigation actions that prioritize equity, social justice, climate justice, rights-based approaches and inclusivity lead to more sustainable outcomes and support transformative change. And I'm glad that the IPCCC pointed that out because in the past, we didn't necessarily see the rights language come in and the human rights lens coming in on these, on these issues. And it, it shows where the solution also lies. The same with the 2030 agenda, to put it back, to put it back on track to end poverty and to create a more inclusive and equitable world people must be free to come together to exchange information and to voice their concerns. It, that's what open societies are all about. But, we, but in reality, if we analyze many country situations around the world, the space for critical debate, for dissent, for protest is being heavily restricted. And unfortunately, also across Europe, at least 50 governments around the world have passed laws that restricts the ability of NGOs to operate or to receive funding from outside or both. In some countries, when citizens criticize their leaders, it is easier to blame foreign influence than to address the real issues. So we must act to reverse this trend of shrinking civic space, which does such harm. And I, when I, I already mentioned I was in Vienna last week and there, there was one member of the panel discussion that I participated in. Um, and what that panel member said struck me that three, actually when I looked at the panel, there were three out of six people who shared the stage of that panel who were in exile from their homeland because they were, had been forced to flee simply because they dare to stand up for human rights. And it was humbling to share the stage with these three women who had paid such a high, high price for defending human rights in Afghanistan, in Iran, and in Russia. And the stories that they told us vividly illustrated the need for an open civic space for the defense of human rights, but also for, for societies to be able to flourish and, and foster and to have the creativity and innovation that we need to address the challenges of today. And let's not forget among all these anniversaries that we also have the 25th anniversary of the UN Declaration on Human Rights Defenders, which for the first time recognized the specific right to defend human rights. But again, if one looks around the world, human rights defenders are frequently subjected to attack, threats, smear campaigns, persecution, because of their peaceful work on behalf of others, in particular, also environmental human rights defenders who are at a particular risk. And we have, if you look at these sad statistics, more than three were murdered each week over the past decade. And that really tells us something. Um, there are campaigns, to bring about more equitable and just societies have included efforts to change laws, to get people released from prison, and to expose corruption. But as Special Rapporteur Mary Lawler reported to the Council earlier this year, their very successes can expose them to even more danger because they confront 
They speak, they speak truth to power. They confront powerful vested interests, exposing issues that many would like to be hidden. During this anniversary year, as we discuss how to rejuvenate this commitment to human rights, universal commitment to human rights, we really need to do much more on civic space and human rights defenders. And we need to connect with communities and especially with young people who are leading and will lead the struggle for universal human rights in the coming decades. In Ireland, you know very well how vital civil society and the voice of the grassroots are in promoting peace. It was a grassroots initiative that created the Tipperary Peace Convention in 1984 to encourage and acknowledge those who work for peace, humanitarian causes and human rights and Ireland's efforts to set up innovative participation formats has really been striking and including on, on marriage equality, for example. So I count on all your support to help us build a much stronger human rights ecosystem that is well-functioning, but also financially sustainable for all the mechanisms that we have in place. And I count on all of you to promote and protect human rights in all corners of the globe for the next 75 years. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Volker, for a really passionate and, and uh, eloquent uh, presentation of your of your priorities. I mean, I, I was particularly struck by your emphasis on on re renewing, rejuvenating uh, a kind of universal human rights culture, and 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 the phrase you used was using it as a compass to help us out of the turmoil, turmoil in which we we find ourselves on many on many fronts. I think that's a really uh, inspiring uh, uh, and, and, and uh, um, passionate appeal to all of us. Um, a number of questions have come in. Um, the first one really relates to um, the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, whose 75th anniversary we're celebrating, as, as you mentioned, Volga. Um, if one is to look back, you know, how can one assess the impact that, that, that the UDHR has had in, in, in real world terms? I mean, I know it's a long period, 75 years, but um, do you think it has lived up to expectations? Um, are there areas in which it has distinctly fallen short? What, what is your, your overall assessment of the impact it has had? On, of course, it's always difficult to have a scientific evidence-based uh, view of 75 years. But I think we will all agree that compared to 75 years ago, this declaration has been an incredible inspiration to actually advance the normative framework that is so important in order for member states, and they have agreed to these obligations actually, uh, on a wide range of issues, civil, political, economic, social, and cultural, but also right to environment now and, and, and also right to development and, and not just pay lip service to it, but translate it into legal obligations in some parts of the world. And that's really a result of, of, of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. In some parts of the world, Europe, for example, you, you have binding mechanisms where the European Convention on Human Rights uh, with the court can lead to binding judgments. Um, in other in inter-American system, the same African unions, African Union is a similar process is we have a bit more issues in Asia. Mm -hmm. We don't have this type of mechanisms, mm -hmm. but and of course you have the UN mechanisms, you have the treaty bodies, the 10 treaty bodies that ask states every so often to report back to them on how they are doing. And and when recommendations are made back to them, it actually leads to changes. The same with the universal periodic review in the context of the Human Rights Council. So I think we have established both the normative framework as a result of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and some mechanisms and institutions that ensure that follow-up is happening. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights has also inspired, let's face it, many social movements for freedoms. It has inspired the anti-apartheid struggle, it has inspired decolonization processes, it has inspired feminist movements, the labor movement, uh, but also 
movements recently of environmental uh, and climate activism. And I, I, I think that's what it is. I, I remember my own stories. I, I read it. I read for the first time the Universal Declaration of Human Rights when I was 15. And it so resonated with me that I kept that text with me my whole life. Um, and because it, I found it, and I, I hope also young people, when they read this text, will find the language, but also the whole conception of it as something that, you know, we are aware that we are endowed with rights, with dignity, that it's not the, the almighty business corporation or the almighty state institution that is in front of us, but we as individuals strive for larger freedoms that makes us all you know prosper and and flourish and and i think that's what human rights has done this doesn't mean at all that there aren't huge challenges and mm. and i think that's important to bear in mind because we we have seen even some questioning of fundamental human rights norms including torture i mean look at after 9 11 even such fundamental principles were, were questioned at the time but it is also important because of the way that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was drafted on the historical context in which it was drafted, has always been a guiding light to do better and, and to advance the human rights agenda more broadly. So I would say without it, we would be, we would be in a very different place. And it, it would also not define the relationship that we have among ourselves and between ourselves and the institutions of the state. Thank you, Volga. I have a follow-up question here from, from uh, Leanne Digny, who's a, a researcher at, at the Institute. She asks, or she, she recalls that, in fact, there were, there were only 58 member states in the UN at the time in 1948. Mm -hmm. uh, and therefore, inevitably, I suppose, it reflected Western values at, um, at the time. Do you think there's a case to be made for revising the declaration so as to bring in a, a broader uh, uh, representation of the, the current UN membership? Yeah, I first of all, I I would very much recall the genesis of the UDHR of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and. Yes, it's true. It was a finite, it was whatever it was, 58 countries or so that at the time participated. But they participated from all continents. It wasn't, of course, all member states because it happened before the decolonization period. Um, this being said, uh, it was the Indian delegate, Hansa Mehta, a woman, um, because many people always associate the Universal Declaration of Human Rights with, with Eleanor Roosevelt, and that's very good because she, Eleanor Roosevelt did, did a lot. But it was actually Hansa Mehta, who, the Indian delegate, who put forward the notion that it is about human rights and not rights of men. Because she wanted to really make sure that it's, you know, it's clear that this is, this is not about uh, I mean, that it's clear that human rights is for everyone, and of course, for, for women and girls. So that what, what that was her. The other one, Eleanor Roosevelt, was the one who put in the idea of economic, social, and cultural rights, because even against the advice of her own State Department at the time, and she had to, to struggle, um, because, of course, her husband, when he was president in 1944, uh, had this Bill of Economic Rights. Um, and so she was very keen to ensure that we have a comprehensive view of human rights. So I don't think we should see, we cannot see the Universal Declaration of Human Rights as a Western thing. It is nourished, was nourished by revolutions, the American, French, Haitian revolution, but also by, by the way, Mali, there is, during the Malian Empire in the 13th century, there was a human rights declaration that was, the, Mali, Mali, the, uh, the, that was adopted um, at the time which was, I would say, probably one, well, you had the Magna Carta, but you had a number of other documents already in Africa, for example, that were very similar. And one should not forget that the Vienna Conference and the Vienna Declaration and Program of Action, which was adopted by consensus, reaffirmed the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and you had 171 member states participate at the time. So, 
I think when we hear that not everyone participated, well, they certainly reconfirmed it um, in Vienna. Uh, and I think we need to use these arguments. Plus, when you sign the charter as a member, as an incoming member state, human rights is also in the charter of the United It's one of the principles and purposes of the United Nations. So I think we need to counter this view that it's a Western thing and it's only a, a small number of states that that have a, that that drafted it. Today, we have a very different uh, perspective on it. Indeed, Roger. I have a question here about uh, the Human Rights Council. Uh, well, what do you say to uh, critics who would observe that uh, regularly con countries with a very dubious record in human rights end up being elected to the council. Does that take away from the council's credibility? Well, it is, of course, a concern uh, that there are sometimes countries elected to it where you have a very, very poor human rights record. Uh, and then I hope that when these elections take place, that this is much more part of the thinking of member states when they elect countries and that there are really commitments extracted from them when they become members of the Human Rights Council. Overall, the legitimacy, I mean, you know, we are in an intergovernmental process, so these are member states deciding themselves how to, how to conduct this. We have seen in those who have been elected to it, to be honest, sometimes it actually helps with to have the detractors within within your system rather than outside the system because there are special responsibilities to, that go along with it and that's part of diplomacy i mean we, we need to find ways and means to engage with them so um, even if you know it would always be better that it's the ones who who have a much better human rights record uh, in other it, it has had this counterintuitively it has, has the effect that you actually uh, then find uh, leverages that perhaps were a bit more difficult in the past. But yes, it is an issue. That's an interesting one. Uh, another question, Fagan, relates to um, the universal peer review uh, procedure. Um, what's your assessment of that? Uh, is, is it working? Is it producing the de desired pressures on individual member states? I think the universal periodic review is a fantastic a fantastic process because it is, as we say, peer reviewed and it reviews everyone. There's no exception to it. And it, in, it allows for this peer review and it is accepted by member states. I mean, it's, I mean that's a good thing. It's, they, they feel that, first of all, nobody is perfect. So you, you can actually go into some quite robust discussions. What we need to do much better in the future is to have the follow up. I mean, we have seen now we are in the fourth cycle that some recommendations keep recurring and they are not addressed. So I hope that, including by a stronger presence of, of my office in the field, that we would be able to do much more in, in terms of making sure that these recommendations that are, that are self-accepted by member states are actually also followed up on. And I think that that moment of how to ensure that we move from you know, a process to actual implementation is, is going to be the next big challenge for us. Okay, there's a range of questions uh, which relate to sort of generic issues about the office and, and, and uh, your work. And, you know, if time permits, I'll get to some of those shortly. But there are also, there's a series of questions about individual country situations, as you can imagine. And I'll just mention a few of them so far. Um, obviously, you have a vast portfolio of, of places with which you have to be, countries with which you have to be concerned. Here's one from Michael Doyle which relates to Myanmar. Um, and I'll just summarize his question, Volker. It's, there have been many calls for stronger UN engagement in the resolution of the crisis in Myanmar, uh, with all the related human rights, uh, humanitarian and other concerns. With the unexpected departure this month of the most recent UN special envoy, what is the current strategy for, for the Myanmar crisis? Um, uh, and again, Michael observes that the ASEAN five-point consensus of April 2021 hasn't had any success. I mean, I know that you and your office do, don't have overall responsibility for the Myanmar crisis, but on the other hand, really looking at the human rights dimension, is there anything that you can tell us uh, of interest in relation to that question? Yeah, so Myanmar 
I mean, I I I, I saw Nolene Heiser, who is the former. Yep. Well, I think I don't know whether she. I think she may still be in office, uh, but she's finishing very soon. And indeed, I think the political process is very fraught. Uh, this being said, I'm glad that the Security Council finally managed to pass a resolution on it by consensus. So, I mean, I mean, they, so that's at least uh, important. It's an important signaling. Um, I do think, I mean, from my, from I used to go quite a lot when I was in UNHCR. I, I used to visit the country quite a lot. It was, of course, uh, before the events uh, of the last two years, uh, but it was still with a very strong presence of the Tatmadaw. Um, of course, in my current function, uh, we are not, I mean, we don't have an office there. Uh, we are doing a lot of the work out of um, out of uh, Bangkok. Uh, and we have, of course, the Special Rapporteur and the Independent, uh, the, the monitoring mission for Myanmar, which are important tools to document, to analyze, but also to ensure that accountability is, 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 is not lost within all of this. I have high hopes for the International Court of Justice um, proceedings that the Gambia brought in, as well as uh, the ICC process. And I do think that the emphasis on accountability is, is absolutely critical. Um, uh, from, from my vantage point where I sit now, I think we really need to see what the day after is going to, there will be a day after, because we know that repression is not going to work. You cannot, I mean, the, the history tells us that repression is, is not going to be the future. And so we will need to prepare for it, including with those uh, in the, within the Myanmar society that um, the, the MUG, but also others who hopefully will, and I think that's one of the realizations, they will come to see that the ethnic divisions, including in particular against the Rohingya, is not part of the future, that when they move forward, they will have to have a, a very different, more ethnically integrated approach, which includes also in particular the Rohingya. Um, so, I mean, I think the, the best way forward is from a human rights perspective to keep not giving up, to keep pushing for accountability, to keep documenting, but also to point out to those who have influence over the country their own responsibilities of, of somehow making it work beyond the ASEAN. I mean, there are other actors as well, and, and I think that's really critical. Thank you, Hagar. Um, Luke Feeney asks a question about uh, access issues in Israel and the OPT, the Occupied Palestinian Territories, and he notes that uh, uh, I think your office has had its issues in the past. Can you comment on that? Yes, I. this is a very sore point uh, because we, about two years ago, and I will actually mention it to the Human Rights Council again on Monday because we have the second round of the council uh, starting next week. Um, so international staff have not been able to get visas. And I have taken this up with the authorities, um, but so far without success. Um, and it's really important that my, my office, I mean, we still have national staff in the occupied Palestinian territories, but uh, my international staff are working out of Jordan. Um, and of course, it would be much, it's so important that our international staff are again present there. And it is an issue of cooperation, frankly. Um, so I hope that there is a realization on the part of, of the Israelis to, to give us these visas. It's absolutely critical. Uh, thank you, Valga. Um, a question from Valerie Hughes about uh, the situation in Syria, um, uh, the, the, um, you know, for which uh, enormous numbers of, of refugees have come and, and continue to come. And obviously, Valerie's question is against the background of the, uh, the shocking drowning off the coast of Greece. Um, can you comment on the apparent ongoing impunity of the Assad regime? Well, uh, again, it's a country where uh, my office is not present, but continues documenting um, with all the other mechanisms, including the IIIM. Um, to make sure that indeed we have the we have the dossiers available 
in 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 accountability issues and as you probably know in some instances where universal jurisdiction applies um, when there have been war criminals Syrian war criminals being caught in I, I know a couple of cases in Germany but also in France and and other places where precisely the type of documentation that we have put forward and, and, and have collected over the years has been very useful from an accountability perspective. So I think that's absolutely critical for us. Yeah. Um, just one more country specific uh, question, Falka, and that is, uh, it, it's one from Keelan O'Sullivan, who's a researcher at the Institute. And she says that uh, the situation in, in Afghanistan remains one of the most extreme instances of widespread systematic violations of human rights, especially women and girls. How can the UN engage with the de facto authorities, the Taliban, to promote and uh, moves towards uh, uh, strengthened human rights in Afghanistan? No, I, I fully agree. I think Afghanistan is, is one of the countries where you, where it is, where you have actually seen a country or the de facto authorities, not, not the country, but the, de facto, the ones who govern the country de facto have moved outside the international order. Because I mean, uh, to the repression against half of the population, well, I called it gender apartheid. And I mean, I know that there are different views of whether or not one can use apartheid, but I think it illustrates what is behind it. And, and uh, I mean, again, I have still got an office presence there. You can imagine the dilemmas that our colleagues go through. We have male and female colleagues. We have actually decided uh, that no one comes to work into the office because uh, we, 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 don't, we, we don't want to follow uh, that directive, um, which means they continue working, but they continue working in different ways. But you know, it's we don't want to follow this this horrible instruction, which is of course also a violation of the Charter of the UN. Um, we have, I mean, the UN as such, of course, has contacts uh, with the de facto authorities, especially in Kabul. But it also has to be said that there is quite a difference. There are different factions within the Taliban. You have the ones who sit in Kandahar. You're sitting some in Kabul. Um, there are in some geographical areas of Afghanistan, there are different practices. So, you know, some of these across the board um, pronouncements don't necessarily always think in. So you also see uh, some uh, governors or some parts of the country where, where local authorities, uh, uh, of course, uh, allow uh, girls to go to primary, secondary education and, and also uh, to work. Um, so the strategy will have to be, first of all, of course, to keep at it, to document, again, accountability comes in, but also the question, how can we make sure that those areas, those geographical areas, where it is possible to work in a, in a, in a, in a more inclusive way, that they get bigger and that at some, at some stage, it will be proven right to actually ensure this more inclusive approach. I think one can never give up on these things and one shouldn't one should always be hoping that with consistent messaging and it has to be coherent messaging by the international community that change could eventually take place. but I, I won't hide from you. it's one of our biggest frustrations. I can imagine. Um, well, a question from Chris O'Connell from Trocra, which is a, a leading Irish uh, humanitarian and development organization. Um, he asked about the issue of the, the, the closing of civil society space. So oh, going beyond, if you like, the pressure to be applied uh, uh, to, to national governments, is, is there something which the international community, I suppose he means the, the UN and other international organizations, is there more that can be done at that global level to try to get a meaningful role in, uh, for civil society in those countries where it's coming under threat? I mean, I can give you the bureaucratic answer, which is that, yes, the UN has issued a UN guidance note on, on civic space for all its UN country teams. And this was drafted both by us, by my office, as well as by UN Women, to make sure that our country offices on the ground are sensitive to this issue, analyze it, but also intervene. 
But I think for us all, the challenge is, and it's a bit what I mentioned before, how do we regain the norms that we are where, that were so painstakingly established over so many years? So what does civic space mean? When it's, what, how does it hurt a society? And I think we need to come back almost to these basics because we know that societies, and I mentioned it before, can only flourish if you allow creativity, if you allow innovation, if you allow meaningful participation, if you allow inclusion, if you allow independent and free media. And that's to the advantage of everyone. It's to the advantage of sustainable development. It, it advances peace and security. And, and, and of course, also it allows for humanitarian affairs to be done in a different way. So bringing out the advantage, I mean, I, when I was young, I was very much influenced by Karl Popper's uh, book, uh, Open Society and Its Enemies, right? We almost need to rewrite it and think about the digital side as well, because there are so many closures of mind there are the obvious ones and when it comes to civic space, but there are the other ones as well that come from the echo chambers in, in social media platforms that actually cloud our minds. And we need to be, you know, owning civic space in a very different way in the future and, and rethink what open space and open debate means today and how we counter the beginnings. I mean, the beginning of encroachment on civic space are always the one where you, have, you may have still a chance to influence it. And sometimes these small signals that we see are not acted upon very quickly. Um, and I think that's a little bit our challenge, you know, bring out the advantages, even from a purely scientific perspective. You know, countries that are open and free thrive better. They're more resilient. They can deal with shocks. Um, those who repress, they will not thrive. They will have difficult, difficult. They will not meet the challenges of the future. And, and again, have a strategy that identifies early warning signals and reacts to that very quickly. I mean, you know, Russia, to give you an example, we have seen in Russia over the last well, more than 15 years, the chipping away at the civic space edifice. And would we have done something better? Um, both within the Russian society, but also outside. Uh, should we have picked it up? What would have what would it have told us? And and I mean, interesting discussion with Memorial uh, recently. They came here. You know, it's the one NGO, the big NGO mm -hmm. that was unfortunately prohibited. Um, so yeah, but it's a it's a very important question for all of us how to think together on on how to promote this open, free, independent space where people feel safe also to to voice what they think absolutely yeah okay um a question from seamus allen who is a researcher in the institute uh, and then seamus really asks about the, the, the theoretical concepts of, of, of human rights um you know are there the, there are there are some who would argue that there should be greater recognition of collective human rights as were well, in addition to to individual rights uh how do you react to those calls I mean, I think uh, I don't have the Universal Declaration of Human Rights with me right now, but uh, I sometimes, uh, I mean, it's good to have theoretical discussions, but frankly, we know that human rights are always embedded in community life. It is at the end of the day, how we interact with each other, how we interact with the institutions of the state, how the state is expected to interact with its people. And also how we interact, and that's then it's with you know development, welfare, and 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 climate change, and you know with with the planet. Um, there is Article Twenty Eight of the Universal Declaration. If I had it with me, I would quote it to you. But it actually talks about everyone has the right to of an international order uh, where these rights and freedoms can be fulfilled, something of that sort. I think it's an, uh, it's an article that is often not very much understood or not very much used, but it actually speaks to this because of course you need the collective to come in to guarantee your rights. That's what also state institutions are like. Sometimes you have to mitigate the trade-offs and the dilemmas 
between public interest and private interest. But again, human rights law provides an answer to it. Look at the health crisis, the public health crisis that we had with the COVID pandemic. Um, I mean, certain freedoms had to be restricted temporarily and in a proportionate manner because of the public health risk. But you, you then you have to meet, so human rights law does provide uh, a mitigated um, form of resolution that deals with, if you like, broader public interest and individual interests and individual freedoms. So I, I think it's an artificial dichotomy. Mm. Uh, I think we need to see it as, as something that human rights law actually addresses and including those parts of, of the UDHR that are often not used. Mm. Okay, I think we have time for about two more questions, if, 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 if we can um, ask you to be patient. Uh, so one is from Ashley McCann, uh, also at the Institute, who uh, mentions the, the, the Human Rights 75 Youth Advisory Group that you have set up as a, an initiative th this year. Uh, in your view, what are the most important ways in which young people can promote respect for human rights? What would you like to see uh, youth doing uh, uh, sort of a, a, as we go forward. Mm -hmm. I mean, the the youth component is is absolutely critical, and uh, we did when I was still uh, in the executive office of the Secretary General. It, there was the human rights, uh, not human. There was the UN seventy five um, uh, celebration, um, and it was interesting because in in, in twenty twenty because there were a number of surveys done, I think over a million people, especially young people, uh, and I think even children were, were surveyed and, and interviewed. And if you asked what are the top concerns, uh, climate change came up and human rights. Um, but of course, these are probably individuals and, and, and young people who are very much engaged with the type of issues that we're engaged in. I think we need to, make sure that the, 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 the concept of what human rights means in our daily lives is, is really disseminated to each and every one in every corner of the world. Because rights awareness is the start of social change. Uh, and I've been in countries, in fact, shocked to see that some, including young people, have no rights awareness. In others, even those with lesser education have rights awareness, and there you have seen the changes. I mean, I remember in Colombia, for example, Colombia is even under, you know, populations that where schooling was very much of an issue and access to, to secondary education, but they had an awareness of their rights, and they knew that they could demand it, and they knew that that wasn't right. And that actually did lead to changes in, in these countries. In others, that's not the case. It's very difficult. So I think we need to, well, by the way, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is the most translated document in the world. If we are in the Guinness Book of Record, um, there's no other, there's no sacred text. It's, it's the Universal Declaration that is the most translated document in the world, which also shows something. Um, and I do think that, you know, we need human rights courses in primary, secondary, tertiary education, and not just in specialized legal or international relations things, we need it in each area of, of study. I mean, a doctor needs to understand, has some basic understanding of human rights, as well as someone who is an engineer or a climate, or someone who is a met wants to study meteorology or a, a worker uh, or someone who, who, who is a plumber. I mean, I think we really need to make sure that we, we make it part and parcel of our upbringing and, and our orientation. And, and that can, I think that can be done. I mean, we, we need to do much more. And I think that also this rights awareness is so, is so critical again. Well, okay, last question just for myself. Um, you, um, uh, you said in, in, in your Vienna speech recently that the, the one uh, uh, on the anniversary of the Vienna conference, that um, the, the 2030 agenda uh, for sustainable development is itself a human rights agenda. I, I strongly agree with that. And, and uh, indeed, I know that you and your predecessors have worked hard to, to get that accepted, uh, that, that dimension. 
as it happens, there will be an SDG summit in uh, September, as you know, and indeed it's being co-facilitated by Ireland and, and Qatar. Would you like to have the human rights uh, dimension of uh, the SDGs brought out more clearly in the in the declaration, which is to issue from that? I mean, I should say I'm speaking on my own behalf, but I, I'm just guessing that you would like to see that brought out because it hasn't, in fact, received as much attention as it should have. I fully agree with you. And of course, <laughs> you know the genesis of the SDGs extremely well. I mean, a lot came from, I mean, a lot of the SDGs are a direct result uh, of the elaborations that happen in the human rights world, um, especially economic, social, and cultural rights, and also some of the special rapporteurs that have been working on it, but also the treaty body, the, the Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. And I, I mean, we did, uh, the, the Danish Institute of Human Rights did an analysis for us a couple of years ago, and they, you are probably aware of it. They actually looked at um, you know, how much of, 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 of the SDGs are actually uh, human rights obligations. And I think they said 95% or so. Mm. And that's important because the SDGs are, of course, agreed at the intergovernmental level in the UN. But they, they are expectations that people have of the institutions that are supposed to serve them. Um, and and they are right. And yes, I hope that especially because of this anniversary year, the human rights anniversary that we really have this year, that during the SDGs, in preparation for the SDGs, summit and with the two co-facilitators, Ireland and Qatar, that we would have a, a strong recognition of the human rights dimension of the SDGs. Um, I think that would indeed be very much welcome. Great. Okay. Thank you so much for a real tour de force. It was fantastic having you and, and uh, we, we really appreciated um, your generosity in making time available and in making your initial presentation and in responding so so fully and so in, 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 so passionately to the to the uh, many questions which we we put to you. There were lots more. I'm sorry we didn't get time to to get to them, but you were extremely kind to uh, make yourself available for for <laughs> to be questioned in that way you have a huge portfolio we wish you every success in in, in tackling it it is really a gigantic job uh, and um, much will, will will rest on your shoulders so the best of luck with the various anniversaries with the human rights council next week and everything you're doing uh, and uh, on behalf of the institute i'd like to thank you very very much next time we very much hope it will be in person Yes, me too. Thank you all very much and thank, great to see you again, David. And indeed, I hope it will be in person next time.